history is marked by great conflicts, isn't it? And I think we understand that those are not just the clash of nations like the allied powers fighting against the uh, Axis forces in World War II. Uh, but in many, time, in many cases, this inver involves intense personal struggles as well. In Greek mythology, we read of the struggle that took place between Achilles and Hector. Uh, in the British Parliament, it was uh, Sir Winston Churchill taking on Lady Astor. Uh, in Hollywood, we hear of the row between Kanye West and Taylor Swift. In the biblical texts, it's Mordecai and Haman. Uh, it's Cain and Abel. It's Paul and Elymas. We see something similar to that taking place this morning in Psalm 52. It's there that we read of the conflict between David and Doeg. Please turn with me in your Bibles, if you haven't already, to Psalm 52. You'll notice that like Psalm 51, this him is prefaced with a superscription. Uh, the heading tells us that this hymn is a mascal, that it's a teaching psalm, a, a contemplative uh, prayer of sorts, uh, written during a, a difficult time in one's life. Uh, we're told that this psalm was written by David, the sweet psalmist of Israel, that it was for the choir director, uh, which tells us that this was not then just a, a psalm of private contemplation, but something that was to be used within that corporate assembly to help shape the, the mindset uh, of God's people. And all of this, I think, doesn't take us by surprise. We've seen this time and time again. But all that changes when we come to the second half of this introduction. It's there that we're told that the king composed this psalm when Doeg the Edomite came and told Saul and said to him, David has come to the house of Ahimelech. Now you may be thinking to yourself, who in the world is Doeg the Edomite? And you are correct in doing so because Doeg is not a significant, he's not a prominent figure uh, in the pages of scripture, but he does crop up. Uh, we find his story presented to us uh, in 1 Samuel chapters 21 and 22. Uh, it, that's where he makes his first and last appearance. But if we're going to understand this text correctly, we need to understand that story because it's going to uh, help shape the true import uh, of this hymn. Well, those chapters will describe a bitter time in the life of the future king, of, of King David. We, we understand that David is on the run from his father-in-law. His father-in-law has murder in his heart. He is vexed by the fact that his son-in-law has greater glory than himself. That God has used him in mighty ways. That God has ripped his, this kingdom from, from the first king and is going to, to give it to this other. This, this man has a heart for him. So David's on the run. He's gone to the city of Nob. This is the place where the temple of the Lord is, or sorry, the tabernacle of the Lord is. Uh, this is where Ahimelech and his family are ministering. And it's there that the fugitive asks for food. He's going to ask for a weapon. Uh, He's going to receive the sword that he used to slice off the head of Goliath of Gath. It's then in, in 1 Samuel chapter 21, verse 7, that we read this, that one of the servants of Saul was there that day, detained before the Lord. And his name was Doeg the Edomite, the chief of Saul's shepherds. We understand that while David is wandering the countryside, Saul is growing increasingly frustrated with his administrators. He's wondering who is conspiring against him because try as he might, he cannot find his wayward son-in-law. He's frustrated by the fact that he cannot re remove this thorn from his flesh. 
And so in, in a fit of frustration, he lashes out at his servants. He accuses them of conspiracy against the crown. It's after this complaint is issued that Doeg, Saul's chief herdsman, muscles his way to the front of the crowd and discloses that he has seen David at Nob, that he's seen him with Ahimelech and the rest of the priesthood. And so Saul, what does Saul do? He immediately summons this priestly family to himself to give an account for their deeds. Why have they given aid to the enemy? If we read the story, we recognize that Ahimelech questioned David, asked him why he was there, why he was asking for food and for weapons. I mean, why wouldn't you go prepared to wherever you're going? David lied to him. He told him that he was on a secret mission for the king and that it was of such importance, such haste, that he, he couldn't uh, bring these important provisions along with him. And so when Ahimelech is answering King Saul, he's truthful in all that he asserts. He is dumbfounded by this charge of treason and says to the king, he says, your servant knows nothing at all of this whole affair. Well, at this the king is enraged and he orders his guards to strike down Ahimelech the high priest, and every single member of his family. I don't know why it was. I suspect that they recognized the evil of this particular command because what happens next is that Saul's soldiers refuse the order of their king. They will not do something so horrific Something which is a, a sacrilege. So what does Saul do? He turns to Doeg. He turns to the foreigner. He turns to the Edomite. Uh, to a man who comes from a, a family who is a, a historic opponent of the children of Israel. And he commands Doeg to strike these individuals down. The report of this is given for us in 1 Samuel 22 verses 18 and 19. Doeg the Edomite turned around and attacked the priest, priests. And he killed that day 85 men who wore the linen ephod. He struck the knob, the city of the priests, with the edge of the sword, both men and women, children and infants, also oxen, donkeys, sheep. He struck with the edge of the sword. What we find is that David is going to respond to this atrocity in, in two ways. First, when, when Abiathar, he is the high priest's son, the only survivor of, of this slaughter, when he comes to David and he tells him of all that has transpired, David blames himself. He says, I knew on that day when Doeg the Edomite was there that he would surely tell Saul. He says, I have surely brought about the death of every person in your father's household. He's deeply disturbed. He is heartbroken. And so the second thing he does is he takes a pen into hand and he begins to compose the psalm before us this morning. He does this in order to teach himself and to teach others what to do when the enemy strikes. Born out of the harsh and tragic reality of life, David teaches us this fundamental lesson. He says... That when the adversary attacks, believers must trust in the loving kindness of God. When the evildoer lands a devastating blow, the believer doesn't go on the offensive. He doesn't take matters into his own hands. No, he relies on the loving kindness of God, not only to punish the wicked, but to preserve the righteous. That's the background. That's the message of Psalm 52. When the enemy ruthlessly attacks, believers trust in the loving kindness of God to punish the wicked and to preserve the righteous. With that in mind, let's stand to read our text uh, for this morning together. Let's stand and read Psalm 52. We'll begin from verse 1. 
If you're visiting with us this morning, we stand simply in recognition that we are not reading from an ordinary book, but from God's divine revelation. Uh, that which alone is God-breathed and, and therefore authoritative for all that we believe and for all that we should say and do. So with that in mind, let's read the text together, beginning from verse 1. Why do you boast in evil, O mighty man? The loving kindness of God endures all day long. Your tongue devises destruction like a sharp razor, O worker of deceit. You love evil more than good, falsehood more than speaking what is right. Selah. You love all words that devour, O deceitful tongue. But God will break you down forever. He will snatch you up and tear you away from your tent and uproot you from the land of the living. Selah. The righteous will see and fear and will laugh at him, saying, Behold, the man who would not make God his refuge, but trusted in the abundance of his riches and was strong in his evil desire. But as for me, I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the loving kindness of God forever and ever. I will give you thanks forever and ever because you have done it. And I will wait on your name. For it is good in the presence of your godly ones. May the Spirit give us ears to hear what he says to the church this morning. Let's, let's bow together. Almighty God, creator of all things visible and invisible, that is our prayer this morning. That you would indeed would strengthen our weak hearts. That you would open our blind eyes and, and unplug our deaf ears. We pray that you're, by your spirit that you would help me to, under, to, to explain this text clearly and accurately so that we might be people who give you the honor that you were due. That we might be a people who walk faithfully before you uh, amidst all the struggles and difficulties of life. That we might not be thrown off course by that which is unexpected. Uh, Father, that the attacks of the evil one would not stray us from that which is right and just and true. So minister to us this morning. Cause this text, text to take root in our hearts and our minds so we might be the people that you have called us to be and do what you have called us to do. We ask this in the precious name of your Son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, brothers and sisters. Please be seated. If Jesus is correct in saying that in this world you will have trouble, and he is indeed correct, then believers need to know how to handle conflict. They need to know what to do with the aggressor. They need to know where their hope lies. Uh, you and I need to know what we ought to do when the enemy attacks. When he hurts our family or steals our property or takes us to court or seeks to damage our reputation. Well, Psalm 53 exhorts us to trust in the loving kindness of God, to turn to Him, to trust Him, uh, to punish the wicked and to preserve the righteous. I want you to understand that the writer conveys this idea throughout his text, and he does so in three ways. We'll notice that he focuses on three different individuals, that in, in verses 1 through 4, he focuses on the wicked, on those who boast in evil, uh, in the folly uh, of their activity. In verses 5, 6, and 7, he then turns his attention to the Lord. Here we'll witness the, God's fury uh, against those who persecute and destroy his own. Then finally, in the last two verses of the text, in verses 8 and 9, the author shifts his focus to the righteous, to those who trust and exercise faith in the name of the Lord. So there's really three divisions to our discussions this morning. 
It begins with the folly of the wicked in verses 1 through 4. Then it's the fury of God in verses 5 through 7. And then we complete uh, that outline with the faith of the righteous in verses 8 and 9. But I want you to understand something else. I want you to understand what it binds this text together. It is the loving kindness of God. It's his hesed. It's his steadfast love. It's his unending goodness towards his own. It's explicitly mentioned in verse 1 at the very beginning of the text. We see it at the end in verse 8. It's implicit in verse 7. But this is the glue that holds everything together. This explains why believers should trust the Lord. Why should they should depend on him and him alone to punish the wicked and to preserve their own lives? So having said that, let's begin by looking at the folly of the wicked in verses 1 through 4. You'll notice that this section begins with a question, which is then followed by a series of indictments. Look again at the text. Why do you boast in evil, O mighty man? The loving kindness of, the, of God endures all day long. Your tongue devises destruction like a sharp razor or worker of deceit. You love evil more than good, falsehood more than speaking what is right. You love all words that devour, O oh, deceitful tongue. As we look at this text, we notice that the psalmist describes four things about the wicked. Uh, being a poet, he's not content in some ways to kind of just give us a list of that, you know, describe one thing after another. You know, th this is a man who is artful. He, he weaves a tapestry, uh, taking one idea and, and, and mixing it with another. But I think for us to understand this, it, you need to allow me to pull a few strands uh, and, and to in some ways separate some of these things that are mixed. So I want you to see four things in this text. First, I think that we discover in, in reading this text that this man has a depraved heart. But we're told that Doeg, he boasted in evil. That while others kept silent about their indiscretions, this man reveled in it. He saw no shame in the slaughter of innocent priests. He wore this as a badge of honor. He, he gloated, uh, telling everyone that who would pause to listen that he did what Saul's seasoned soldiers refused to do, never asking himself why they refused to do it. He simply gloried. He simply celebrated this thing. Why? Because his heart is twisted. This is a man with no morals, no mercy. This is a man who cut down men and women, children and infants without a hint of concern. Because his heart was depraved. Because he loved evil more than good. Second, we'll see that this wicked man possessed a devious mind. The beginning of verse 2 reveals that Doeg was a man who devised destruction, that lying awake at night, he plotted the downfall of others. That to get a leg up on the competition, he concocted one scheme after another, uh, calculating how his opponents would respond and, and then devising uh, contingencies to, to undertake for that. We learned earlier in Psalm, or, or in 1 Samuel 21, that Doeg had seen David and Nob. But what we learn after is that he didn't immediately report that to Saul. He didn't take that necessary information to the king, information that the king has made well known to the entirety of his kingdom, that he wants to know where his son-in-law is. But Doeg keeps that to himself. He only reveals it after the assembly has been called. He only reveals it after Saul has, has charged his people with conspiracy. 
He only reveals this information after everyone else has been silent. It's only then that he comes forward. That he presents the information the king so desperately needs. And he does so in a fashion that he is exalted above Saul's other servants. This is a man who is calculated in all that he does. Third, in looking at the psalmist's indictment, we see that Doeg embraced a destructive will. That he devised destruction, not, not just harm. The idea here, the word that is used here means a gaping hole. It means a mass of nothingness. It means to bring absolute ruin to the object of one's concern. I don't just want to hurt them. I want to do away with them. I want to wipe them off the face of the planet as if they never existed at all. This was a man who had a destructive will who actively pursued these nefarious plans, so much so that he is called a worker of deceit in the latter part of verse 2. He is not squeamish about getting his hands dirty, about doing what no one else will dare to do. To him, this is a virtue. One that's to be actively pursued. Well, the fourth and final characteristic, I think, is is that this wicked individual has a deceitful tongue. And this is what David seems to highlight throughout the course uh, of these first through four verses. Uh, you'll, you'll notice in verse 1 that Doeg boasts. That in verse 2, it's his tongue that seems to be the, the primary means by which he devises destruction. In verse 3, it's the, the wicked one who loves falsehood, telling lies more than speaking what is right. In verse 4, he, he loves words that devour, leading the psalmist to portray him as one who is described as a deceitful tongue. That's the totality of his being. David uses this descriptor because the tongue is this individual's weapon of choice. He, he prefers falsehood to a physical contra- confrontation. Uh, he, this is a man who is allergic to the truth who cloaks his true intentions in a, in a blanket of lies. His verbal feint is his favorite strategy, one that he employs with rigor, and with excellence, with one success after another. Verse 2 tells us that his tongue devises destruction and says that it is like a sharp razor. The picture here is one whose words are so smooth smooth but deceptively sharp that you don't notice the cutting until the damage has been done. That's the idea. Have you ever met a person like that? A person who begins a conversation with you, and maybe they begin by, you know, emphasizing those points on which you agree, but somewhere along the line in the course of that conversation, things take a twist, a turn, barely noticed. And suddenly you're at odds. Suddenly you are the victim of a verbal assault. And you don't really know how you got there. That's what this man does over and over and over again. Lies, innuendo, uh, character assassination. Th- this is his stock in trade. And people don't know that they've been sliced and diced until it's too late. Well, in reading this catalog of sins, we, we might be tempted to think that David's purpose is simply to, to underscore the abominable character of this individual. And that is what he's doing, but that is not his point. It's not the whole. David's overarching goal is to present the folly of such an individual. Go back to verse 1. 
There's a question that is stated at the beginning of this psalm, and I want you to understand that it is entirely sarcastic. Entirely, from beginning to end. In verse 1. Why do you boast in evil, O mighty man? You who present yourself to be a stalwart soldier of the republic. An honorable warrior. You, oh, killer of priests. You, butcher of children and infants, of of oxen and, and sheep and goats. Why do you devise these evil ways? He kicks it up in the second line of verse 1. Because this is where the true irony lies in this. Why do you boast in evil, O mighty man? The loving kindness of God endures all day long. I want you to recognize the true import of this text. Let me do this by just adding a few words. Why do you boast in evil, O mighty man? Do you not know that the loving kindness of God endures all day long? You think you are high and mighty, that you're strong, that you can do whatever you want to do and get away with it. Don't you realize who you're messing with? Don't you realize that you are fighting the one who formed man out of the dust of the earth? That you have the one who destroyed the the entire planet in in a flood? The, The one who brought Egypt to its knees through the course of ten plagues? You are challenging God, the all-powerful being. You are challenging the God, the self-sufficient one, who has drawn a, a people to himself, a people whom he has entered into a covenant with, a people who are an object of his steadfast love, a love that never shrinks back, or dries up, or cops out, or lets down. By preying on his people, O mighty man, you have challenged sovereignty to a duel. How do you think that that is going to work out for you? That's the import of verse 1. I think at this point, we might be tempted to ridicule the wicked. After all, who would be so dumb? Who would be so blind as to embrace this depraved heart, this devious mind, this destructive will? Are not the consequences of a deceitful tongue plain for all to see? Will they not be found out at some point? Yet we need to recognize that this is a picture of us. It's a picture of us in our unregenerate state. We may not have committed the same sins of uh, of Doeg, but we have committed sins of the same kind, maybe to a, a lesser degree than him. That we are all guilty of this. That, that, that it's only the grace of God, his mercy, in bringing us to himself. And giving us the faith to believe that we have entered into a a new realm of existence. That we have turned from self to Him. That we have been granted new life through the work of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, on Calvary's cross. This indeed is God's mercy. But that mercy will not be shown to the wicked. To those who continue to resist his steadfast love. Those who despise the the loving kindness of God will not have to wait long to see how God responds. Because that is exactly what he does in in verses 5, 6, and 7. Look at how he meets their hubris. Note the fury of God having abused his loved ones. We see that God will punish the wicked 
and that the effects of that judgment are described in verse 5 on, on the wicked. We're told there that this will be a violent judgment, that he will break them down, that he will pulverize them, that he will crush them into oblivion. We're, we're, we see that his judgment will be devastating. We're told that God will snatch them up. Uh, the term that's used there describes a, either a coal that has been plucked out of the fire or a, a fire that has been kicked over, scattered, so that that ember no longer has connection with the source of its power. It, it's left alone. It's left destitute. It, it's left in a state where it becomes cold and lifeless never to be useful again. We see that God's retribution here is going to be swift and unstoppable, that the wicked will be torn from his tent, that God will remove him from that place of security, from a place amongst his friends and his family, that he'll be left destitute. We see that God's justice will be permanent, that it will be final, that God will uproot these individuals from the land of the living. They will be struck down never to rise again. The impact is so great that others respond. That those who see it cannot help but be affected. So that's what we find in verses 6 and 7. We see the, the effect of God's fury on the righteous as well. Look at verse 6. David begins by telling us that the righteous will see and fear. It, it, it's sometimes hard for believers to, to understand how the wicked can prosper and, and do so at the expense of the faithful, how they can get away with such evil as Doeg appears to have done with the slaughter of these priests. Yet God's people, those who are rightly related to him, they will at some point have the satisfaction of seeing the Lord's judgment on those who have ruined the lives of so many others. But you'll notice that this response is not one of rejoicing. It's not a celebration. It's fear. Commenting on this passage, Pastor Richard Phillips states the following. He says this. He says, whenever we observe the downfall of a proud defier of God, we should realize how greatly God hates all sin, including our own. He says this was Paul's warning to the Gentile Christians who had noted God's judgment on the unbelieving Jews of their time. He says it's true. Paul acknowledges that the unbelieving Jews were broken off from the olive tree and that believing Jews or believing Gentiles were grafted in for salvation. But he proceeds to caution Gentile Christians against complacency. In Romans 10, verses 20 and 21, the apostle states, they, this is the Jewish uh, nation, they were broken off because of their unbelief. But you stand fast through faith. So do not become proud, but fear. Fear, for if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. He says, seeing God's judgment on the wicked should only increase the Christian's reverent awe of God. Recalling the Lord's command to his redeemed people, be holy, for I am holy. Following the initial shock of God's judgment upon the wicked, the believer's fear is soon replaced by laughter. Look at the, the second part of verse 6. The righteous will see and fear and will laugh at him. At other points in scriptures, believers are, are, are told that they should not applaud the destruction of their opponents. For example, uh, in Proverbs chapter 24, verses uh, 17 and, and 18, this is what we read. Do not rejoice when your enemy falls. Do not let your heart be glad when he stumbles. Or the Lord will see it and be displeased. 
and will turn his anger away from him. I think the implication of that last line is actually far more ominous than it seems. I think the true import of it is this. Do not rejoice when your enemy falls or the Lord will turn away from him to you. Not only will he deal with their sin, he'll deal with yours as well. As such, we need to recognize that the believer's laughter, I think his derision that is mentioned here in this particular text, is not aimed so much at the person, but at the mindset which they embraced. The mindset that governed this individual's wicked pursuits. Look then at, at verse 7, which seems to bear that out. The, the psalmist writes, Behold the man who would not take or would not make God his refuge, but trusted in the abundance of his riches and was strong in his evil desire. See, the wicked individual has rejected God. He's refused to, to submit to the Lord's uh, guidance or to seek his protection. He, he thought he knew better. He thought that he could strengthen himself by defrauding his neighbors, by devouring their wealth and their status through his deceptive ploys. He thought he could make himself immune. And yet God's, fall, God's fury just reveals the utter folly of such an approach. You, you can't defy God. You can't threaten his people and hope to escape unscathed. You can't amass enough riches. You can't hoard enough power. You can't build a castle strong enough to stay the hand of Almighty God, the one who is, by definition, all-powerful, the one who knows no equal. One small breath from his lips can obliterate all of us in a second. Having considered the folly of the wicked and the fury of God, we now turn to the faith of the righteous. Those who have turned to God, those who have placed their confidence, not in self, but in his steadfast love. What we're told in verses 8 and 9 is that they will experience several blessings. David highlights really three of them in these last two verses. First, he tells us that the believer will prosper in God's presence. Look at verse 8. The text says, but as for me, note, he's making a massive contrast here. He's saying this, this cannot be more distinct. This is light versus darkness. There, there's one way or the other. You can be wicked or you can be righteous. This is the path of the righteous. He tells us that the believer will prosper in God's presence. They'll be like this olive tree. An olive tree, it's, it's a hardy plant. Uh, it, it can grow for centuries. Uh, there are olive trees on the Mount of Olives even today that they suspect are, are at least a thousand years old. But we're told that you can chop that tree down and yet its tendrils will continue to grow. That it'll continue to be productive. That, that on average, an olive tree produces about six gallons of, of of olive oil per tree. And that is fruit is used for all kinds of applications. For food, sustenance, for cooking, for medication, for cosmetics. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. But you'll notice in this psalm that David is not describing the ordinary. He's not describing the the olive tree that, that survives in the, the harsh, arid desert. That, that the, the olive tree that you find in the, the backyard in the Middle East. No, this tree has been planted in the house of God, where it is constantly nurtured and cared for. And like this tree, the, the righteous person will prosper because God has brought him into his personal dwelling a place where his affections are freely bestowed on the righteous. And since God's steadfast love, it never peters out. Since it has no expiry date, 
since it's constantly available, the believer will never stop trusting or growing in God's presence. So first we find that the righteous will prosper in God's presence. Second, examining verse 9, we find that the believer will continue to praise God in the midst of his people. In my version, verse, verse 9 reads as follows, I will give you thanks forever because you have done it, and I will wait on your name for it is good in the presence of your godly ones. On this occasion, I don't find this is always the case, but on this occasion I find that the NIV actually clarifies how things go together in this particular text. It, it renders this, the text this way, at least the first, the first two lines and the last puts them together. For what you have done, I will always praise you in the presence of your faithful people. I think that's the main idea in this, this particular verse. And in saying that, I want you to notice the shift in the verb tense. You notice what transpired in verses 5, 6, and 7? All of that was placed in the future tense. That David says that God will break down the wicked, that he will snatch them up, that he will tear them away, that God will root, uproot them from the land of the living. But here in verses 8 and 9, the psalmist shifts to the past tense. Not because God has already done this. Doeg is still out there. Doeg is still marching around. He's still gloating in his accomplishments. And yet the psalmist switches to the past tense here because he is, a, he is certain of God's actions. If God says he is going to judge the wicked, he will do it. It cannot be otherwise. And so it's for this reason that the righteous thanks, thank, gives thanks to the Lord. But you'll notice again, he doesn't do this in isolation. He does this in the presence of others. He does this amongst the, the company of the faithful, among those who have a common commitment to the, the, their sovereign creator. Uh, it's among those who have recognized that he is the God of wonders, the one who has interceded on their behalf time and time and time again. And their praise is unending because the Lord never ceases to care for his own. Picking up what we've missed, we note one final response. That in the third and fourth lines of this verse, the righteous commit to waiting patiently for the Lord. They do so, they exhibit this, this type of persevering faith because of who God is. Psalmist says, I will wait on your name, for it is good. God's name is the total embodiment of his nature. It encompasses his immutable attributes, his awe-inspiring actions, his incomparable reputation. So what we find here is that David is anchoring his, his life in the stuff that makes God God. That which distinguishes him from all others. He stakes his entire existence, all of his hopes and dreams, all of his safety and security in the divine being. Why? Because that being is good. Men will deceive, but God is always truthful. Men will stumble, but God remains a fixed point. Uh, an indomitable lighthouse that will never be moved. Men often fall short uh, of their, their desired accomplishments, no matter how noble those may be. But with God, there's never a lack. There's never a deviation. He never fails to accomplish what He ordains. He fulfills it perfectly. And so the only logical response is to rest in God's name. 
Is that your experience this morning? Are you waiting on the Lord? Are you resting in Him or are you anxious? Are you overly concerned about the current state of affairs, so much so that it dominates your thoughts, that it, it robs you of your sleep, that, that it, it, it's a thief taking all a, every sense, every shred of peace? Or are you tormented by the thought of someone else taking advantage of your position? Are you scared that you're vulnerable to attack? Because you're not. Not if you've placed your faith in the living God. Not if you've put your, your belief in Christ, the one who died on Calvary's cross. To redeem you from sin and death and destruction. There is no greater stronghold than Him. The wicked forsake the loving kindness of God. They will be punished for their, their evil deeds. But the righteous cling to him and they are protected both now and forever. And so as believers, we must stay the course. May, may all of our trials, all of our adversaries do nothing but one thing. May they simply drive us closer to our all-sufficient God. I think Spurgeon said it well. He said, let us lean on God with all our might. Let us throw ourselves on his faithfulness as we do on our beds, bringing all our weariness to his dear, to his dear rest. Brothers and sisters, I want you to remember the lesson of this psalm. When you're attacked by ruthless adversaries, believers must trust in the loving kindness of God. We trust that loving kindness First, to punish the wicked, and secondly, to preserve the righteous. Let's pray together. Great God in heaven, we know that you are a being who is not limited by space or time. And so while we cannot see you, we rejoice in you. We do so because we, we know that your son did come, that he did take on human flesh, that he did walk this earth and do so perfectly so that he might go to Calvary's cross, so that he might pay the punishment that we deserved, so that we might have life through faith in him and his completed work. Father, we ask, as we go from this place today, that we would not forget that work, that we would not fail to remember your loving kindness towards your people. We pray that it would guide our steps, that it would guard our thoughts. Father, that it would give us hope in the days ahead. Father, for those who do not know you, who are yet living lives of rebellion, those who have failed to bend the knee, Father, we pray that you would draw them to yourself. That you would conquer those cold hearts. That you would give them a heart that is responsive to your gospel. That they would see your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, for who he truly is. The only Savior the Almighty One who gave His life for them. Draw them to Yourself. Change them from the inside out. Cause them to give You greater honor and glory. And we pray that for ourselves as well. Teach us, O God, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen.